Hi. <laughs> what a marvelous transition and video. All right. Thank you all for joining us today for this panel session. Uh, it's going to be in English because we have amazing speakers who speak English, so we're making it very inclusive today. Um, so welcome to this uh, panel. I'm going to see real quick if this works, because then normally, nope, normally we have some slides. Doesn't seem to be working, so okay. Um, so thank you for, for joining us today for this panel, where we'll explore how local solutions and innovations can help address global challenges. I'm Louise, I'm the Global 3.0 House Coordinator at ACTED, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, the 3.0 Houses are collaborative hubs that were launched by ACTED and local civil society organizations to really help uh, empower and train local change makers who strive to go and work towards a zero carbon, zero exclusion, and zero poverty world. So today we're really happy to have three zero houses, mainly in Asia, um, in the Philippines, Tajikistan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and we hope to expand the initiative in Africa and the Middle East quite soon. Um, so today, and I'm really sorry, because I think the slides, let me check if this works. Uh, okay, perfect. There we go. Um, so today the discussion that we want to have is around how do we address climate change and social injustices by leveraging local entrepreneurship. And we have a wonderful panel of speakers today who's, who are going to help us kind of explore this topic. Um, so with us today we have speakers uh, that come from different parts of the world. Uh, and we are very happy to have some of our 3.0 House partners, some of our 3.0 House coordinators uh, with us today. And I'm going to uh, do a quick presentation. So we have Sabuat, who is an activist, you can show your hand, uh, who is an activist and the founder of the National Business Accelerator, Rost, uh, that aims to empower uh, entrepreneurs in Tajikistan and who's part of the the three zero house. So thank you so much, Sabuat, for, for being here. And next we have Thrain. Uh, Thrain, you can say hi. Um, you're the director of community engagement, public outreach, and education at Doine, which is a social enterprise focused on citizen-led heritage conservation and urban regeneration in Yangon, Myanmar. Thank you, Thrain, for being here. We have two 3.0 House coordinators. One 3.0 House coordinator is coming from the Philippines, Mai, say hi Mai. Um, and one coordinator from Sri Lanka, Danusia. And last but not least, we also have um, our partner, uh, Jonathan, uh, who's the founder of Impact Hub, which incubates thousands of social enterprises across 100 physical spaces worldwide. And Jonathan, you also founded Civic, which empowers communities in some of the world's most challenging areas to tackle complex problems. So thank you all for joining me today and for um, allowing me a little bit to, to pick your brains on this topic. Uh, I really wanna go into how the vital role of grassroots approaches is really important to drive meaningful change. And I really wanna understand how you see entrepreneurship and innovation in your countries and within your communities as powerful tools to advance social and ecological transitions. So thank you again for joining and let's start. So maybe for my first question, I kind of wanted to understand a bit more how you, you see things in your, in your countries and within your communities. I know we were talking about this uh, yesterday about the fact that we know that there are, you know, cri ecological crises and social crises going on, they're intensifying, unfortunately, and they're mutually reinforcing, which poses significant risks. And sometimes I think at times it's really, really hard to stay optimistic and to keep, you know, hope on what's happening. And so I feel like innovation and entrepreneurship are ways of steering away from inaction, which is something that we're oftentimes tempted to do. 
Um, and so I'm really curious, and I think the audience here would be really interesting in knowing how you vision this. And maybe my first question for you all is, how do you identify and address the unique challenges faced by your communities through your organizations or through the three zero houses? And maybe what are the lessons learned uh, that you have from developing localized approaches? So maybe, Mai, you want to start, and I'm going to put the, the slides that go with this. Okay, sure, Louise. Uh, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. So um, I was also here in the opening earlier. Uh, so this is thanks for this question uh, on really how uh, how do we actually identify these needs and challenges, uh, especially for a country like the Philippines. So uh, just to give a bit of context to the Philippines, uh, so since we're on kind of the other side of the world, it took me like 18 hours to get here. <laughs> uh, we are we are a, a, a middle a low low to middle income country. So by size, we are um, a bit uh, smaller than France, but by population, we are larger than France. So I I think I I think you guys are at around France. Uh, the uh, the French population is around uh, 70. 5 million, uh, the Filipinos are around 115 million. Um, against this backdrop, we are number one, or, or almost always in the top three, uh, most at risk in terms of climate impacts. Um, around a fifth of our population are still uh, considered poor. So uh, I would go directly to uh, how we actually identify challenges, especially against this tension that we always have to manage. We are always in having to balance uh, the economic need, the environmental need, and the social need uh, for our communities. So for us within the 30 House of Philippines, so I represent the, the network of organizations in the Philippines, it always has to have this perspective, uh, the, the, the economic, the social, and environmental perspective. And I can share a bit about um, the, the enterprises that have come uh, that are in the network. So I think it was flashing earlier the QR code, no, um, where you can actually explore a bit more uh, of the organizations um, within the network. So an example of this is Mad Travel. Uh, Philippines is actually known for its wonderful uh, uh, destinations. No, if you want to go go to nice beaches, uh, explore the pristine uh, underwater of the Philippines, uh, and actually even mountains, uh, rich culture. Um, tourism is a very important industry uh, for the country, um, and uh, social entrepreneurs uh, in the Philippines are also very much vibrant. We have over 100,000 uh, social enterprises. And given this perspective, the way we view challenges uh, in, in the Philippines uh, come with also the opportunity. And this enterprise, uh, Mad Travel, for example, what they did is um, typically, if you have tourism uh, spots, uh, tourist industries, um, it's always subject to environmental degradation. Uh, but apart from that, it actually actually becomes a source of income for communities. So what Mad Travel uh, aimed to do uh, a decade ago when they started um, this enterprise uh, was to make tourism uh, more sustainable by really working uh, with indigenous groups who are actually the protectors of the land. Uh, but apart from that, because their passion is on environmental uh, protection, uh, they, uh, it actually comes with uh, reforestation with the community. Um, but it, it can't just be the environmental side. So even if they uh, are, are really into uh, environmental protection, they want to conserve the forest, the truth of the matter is their community partners need income. So they actually explored into what we call uh, agroforestry, wherein you could, uh, apart from actually uh, rehabilitating degraded lands, ensuring that forests are protected, uh, they actually uh, create livelihood for, for their indigenous community partners so that uh, they can actually plant crops that they can sell, uh, like cashew, uh, 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 calamansi, uh, I, I, I don't know what's the English translation uh, for, for, for this, but I think the closest is, is, is lemon. Um, so uh, that, that's the way uh, social enterprises have, have emerged in the Philippines. It was always about addressing a certain social and environmental need, but using uh, entrepreneurial approaches. Um, and in terms of need, because the Philippines is actually quite big, um, there are different needs that are, have to be really localized. So in that case, for example, since they work with indigenous communities, it's a very distinct need, let's say, from another uh, community, let's say, from, uh, from urban communities. 
So I will stop there first, I think. <laughs> so, but generally, it's really having to manage this tension for a country like the Philippines, uh, where we are still not a, a, a high-income country. A lot are still poor. Right now, actually, we're another typhoon just passed through the country. We are, we are like facing 20 typhoons every year. Um, I don't think that's the case here uh, with you. So it always has to be the challenge, um, because one typhoon will, will destroy livelihoods uh, for, for many of the Filipinos. So it has to have that nuanced approach, ma managing the environmental, the economic, and the social tensions uh, in the country. Thanks, Mai. What about you, uh, Sabo, from coming from Tajikistan? Can you give us a bit of lessons learned? Uh, thank you. So Tajikistan, I'm not sure if uh, a lot of people sitting here know even about this country that exists <laughs> in the heart of the Central Asia. It's a very, um, our population is not like Philippines, it's totally opposite. We have only 9 million um, uh, people living in Tajikistan. Um, uh, and it's a mountainous ca country, more than 90% of this country uh, of our uh, land is mountains. Uh, and um, I would, uh, I, I just recently also heard about uh, a new term, we are double landlocked country, which means that we are a landlocked country surrounded by landlocked countries. So this uh, really uh, brings up a lot of challenges in terms of economical opportunity because we don't have the way to, you know, like, uh, uh, to, to the sea, basically, it's uh, quite uh, yeah, challenging. And, uh, of course, um, in addition to that, Tajikistan is one of the mo uh, so former Soviet Union countries which, um, which still, I would say, depend on the economic uh, vibration of uh, Russia. They have a lot of migrants, uh, working migrants, uh, going uh, to, to work in Russia and also the, all the political and geographical, geopolitical situation happening now affected Tajikistan uh, quite uh, quite serious, I would say. So that has created, uh, of course, also, I mean, along with the challenges, we see also the opportunities. Um, Tajikistan population, more than 70% is youth, and also um, Tajikistan is uh, really rich with uh, some minerals and also agricultural opportunities. So uh, basically, um, I would like to tell about the organization which I'm representing today. It's a uh, business accelerator, ROS, which was established within the Triple Zero House in Tajikistan, um, absorbing the result of former projects uh, of donor funded. So the needs of the um, population, let's say, the need of my country at the moment is creating job opportunities, diversify the private sector, um, uh, the, the private sector services, and also to be able uh, to get into um, other markets. Uh, so that we will be less dependent on the remittances coming from, let's say, Russia. And uh, also to empower the less advantaged uh, population or group of populations of Tajikistan, which are basically women and youth living mostly in rural areas. So uh, with the business accelerator, we have established a special fund within the triple zero house we get uh, the opportunity um, to actually um, tailor some uh, <coughs> very good solutions to the needs of certain groups of population, including the climate um, considerations. Because we, Tajikistan is uh, very vulnerable uh, when it comes to uh, climatic, uh, climatic changes especially with the drought, with the landslides, as well as we are quite a seismic country. Uh, so that is why uh, we try to consider all those solutions, uh, especially when it comes to um, alternative energy, because we do suffer from the uh, lack of um, stable energy in the country. So these are the solutions basically around the country. Uh, these are the challenges and the solutions could be applied in, uh, in the context of Tajikistan. 
Thanks, Sabo, for this overview of Tajikistan. How about you, Turin and, and Danusia? Any good uh, insights on localized approaches in, in Sri Lanka and, and Myanmar? Thank you, Louise. Um, so again, um, it was uh, such an honor to be here with our three zero house colleagues, and uh, and then thank you, Ajay um, and Providence, for inviting us to be here today. Um, for responding to the question, I also want to give you a, a little bit of ab uh, context on uh, on Myanmar uh, or of Yamni is uh, in in. Uh, in French. Um, so currently, uh, our country is going through uh, 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 very difficult times. Um, we are following the, uh, the pandemic. We went straight into uh, a civil war following a, a, a very devastating uh, coup d'etat by the military junta in 2021. And uh, since then, uh, about two thirds of the country is in a death conflict, um, and then the, the economy is uh, in, in dire straits. Uh, as for the recent UNDP reports, um, the middle class has shrunk uh, by fifty percent, uh, leaving about forty-two million people um, at the risk of poverty and. Uh, about 13 million uh, facing extreme poverty and food insecurity. Um, to make the matter worse, uh, since um, early, uh, late 2000s, um, Myanmar was considered one of the uh, highest risk country for climate uh, change events. Um, just before I I fly here, uh, as my 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 mention that. Um, the, the the typhoon that go through um, Philippines, uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and the remnant of it arrive um, a part of Myanmar and cause flooding. Um, hundreds of people lost their life. Um, many still missing. Around six hundred and thirty thousand people are uh, affected by the flooding um, because of the. Uh, the conflict and the weak and governance system, the early warning system uh, were not functioning uh, and causing such devastation. So, and this is a context where we were working in. Um, so, um, doing uh, our organization is a, a, a social enterprise before the, the double crisis, what we call like the pandemic and the coup d'etat. Um, we were uh, uh, design practice, uh, participatory design practice, working on uh, heritage restoration and, and public space uh, uh, upgrade. But after the, the 2021 coup d'etat, we pivoted most of our operations into humanitarian and, and, and development work. And the way we work and the, is that uh, following the coup, what happened is that most of the NGO and the NGO lost their operational license in Myanmar. Uh, many had to leave the country. Many had limited um, operational uh, approval from the government, military government. So that leave a uh, space uh, where uh, private or entrepreneurial uh, organizations uh, can come in. Where we pivoted our operations into that. So we gather around like a. Uh, uh, as a uh, response to the humanitarian crisis, we gather around uh, around 60 um, uh, grassroots community, community organizations into a network, and then that group has now grown into over 200 in, in Myanmar, in Yangon only. And through that, uh, we provide two flagship programs, what we call the neighborhood network, where we provide um, uh, training for them to be more accountable, more um, Operation that they have uh, improved their operation of effectiveness, and of course through um, access to fundraising and uh, and uh, sustainability as well. So with Three Zero House, we are providing um, the two flagship program, the Neighborhood Network and the Young City Shaper, um, through which uh, we are doing quite a lot of uh, change to the uh, situations. Um, like for example, Three Zero House. Uh, it has become uh, the physical, the house has become a, a beacon of hope for many young people who are 
apparently uh, trying to escape the country because of their forceful um, uh, enlistment for, into the military service. So this become a safe space for young people to convene, to talk about their issues. So um, um, it's really a, 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 a important uh, initiative. The lesson learned would be that uh, through localization um, approach, what we could say is that working with the grassroots community, if we can really uh, build their capacity, it will be the, um, the most effective, um, um, easy to mobilize, and then also most economical way of, of uh, delivering um, uh, humanitarian and development initiatives. Thank you. Hi. Um, so what about Sri Lanka? So Sri Lanka, it's a beautiful country. It's a small island. We used to call it the Pearl of um, Indian Ocean. So it's located at the south um, part of India, very close to the Maldives. We have a lot of resources, natural ones. Uh, you might have heard about the tea of Ceylon. So we have a lot of tea plantations, a lot of paddy fields, a lot of, a lot of uh, rubber fields, um, a lot of um, uh, gems like diamonds, sapphire. So a lot of resources. At the same time, uh, we have suffered a lot. Uh, especially, uh, we had a 30 years uh, civil war. Uh, we had a crisis, uh, a lot of crisis actually political one, so we have an election coming soon. Uh, we'll be electing our new president uh, this Saturday. Uh, we have also economic crisis, so a lot, a lot of young people are leaving the country. And Sri Lanka is also an aging country, so more 60% of the country are above 30. So you can imagine a lot of, uh, there are a lot of lacking opportunities, that's why people are leaving. At the same time, Sri Lanka is a very educated country. So as the Three Zero House, how can we co-design, uh, empower the youth, co-design opportunities with them so that they can reinvest themselves in the country, um, they can find themselves um, some solutions, innovation, um, they can motivate also some people uh, from outside to come back. So it's all about this. And how do we identify those issues, those challenges, so that they can address them? Um, so the business model of the Three Zero House in Sri Lanka is very specific. We are completely integrated in the um, ACTED uh, project. So in Sri Lanka, we have three of them. Uh, one is about the plastic waste management. Uh, another one is about environmental um, activism and rights. And another one is about uh, disaster resilience. Because Sri Lanka is also, as most of the Southeast uh, um, Asian country, we are very prone to climate change effects like cyclones, tsunami, uh, dr drought, floods, etc. So how can we uh, tackle all of this? So as acted uh, organization, we do work with communities. Um, it means fishermen, it means farmers, it means SMEs, uh, youth uh, within universities, children, etc. So we do uh, activities at the grassroots level. And uh, what we found out, usually people would speak, they would talk. Three Zero House is a space, so we foster the dialogue. Um, so we have developed a couple of activities. One of them is called the Thumbs Up Meetup. Uh, so basically we have three pillars around the Three Zero. Zero carbon, zero exclusion, zero poverty. We just go deeper within uh, those pillars, for instance, um, w around uh, uh, zero poverty, we can discuss about uh, internal migration. Um, around zero exclusion, we can talk about discrimination. So we choose topics like this, we gather people, and we foster the dialogue. So they will be gaining knowledge, but they will be also like sharing their thoughts, uh, the um, uh, the conception of. Uh, what I mean, what they feel, what they would like to have, what kind of opportunities is missing in the country, and we uh, gather all those ideas and we co-design programs with them. So this is the way we work. Uh, this is the way we function in Sri Lanka, and so far it's working well. And I feel like also it's because through ACTED we are able to reach those um, last mile uh, uh, communities. Thanks, Dennis and Turin, for those uh, those insights. And it's really interesting to hear how, through 
the different countries in which you're in, um, you really use localized approaches and localized solutions to really tackle social and, and, and climate change um, challenges in your countries and you do it through uh, the empowerment of local communities and we've seen how, that, how much that is important and way more effective sometimes than uh, bigger, I would say, organization just coming in and, and doing kind of a top-down approach. Um, Jonathan, I'd like to hear you also talk to us a little bit about those localized approaches. I mean, you've worked with Impact Hub, Civic, so I'm sure you have also lots of lessons learned that you can share with us uh, on this topic. I, I mean, I love this question because it's, it's, it's so clear that we have pretty much everything that we could ever hope to have even the world's most difficult problems, the solutions are there. They're just hiding in plain sight. And, and all these talents just need unlocking. And, and so, you know, reflecting a little bit on um, what the four of you have, have shared, I, I think a new profession is being born. Um, and it might sound a bit grand to, to talk in these terms, but, you know, this is, this is a role, I think, that, that is as important to this century, as doctors and scientists were to centuries gone by. I don't quite know what to call it, but there's a convening capacity um, that is remarkable uh, in each of the spaces and places in which you're working. And if I may just share some quick short stories, um, two little bits of inspiration that were behind Impact Hub and, and, and other little adventures. The first um, is starts on this bridge. Um, some of you might recognize it as the beautiful bridge that connects east and west Mostar. Sadly, I was there at the height of the war, and this bridge had been long since smashed up. Um, and the UN had uh, built a rickety thing connecting east and west. And on this bridge, I met a remarkable young lady. Um, unlike all of her friends, she didn't want to leave the city. Uh, we were organizing uh, buses to take people out, but but. There she was, wanting to stay. And I asked her why. And she said, look, I'm Muslim, and despite the fact that my family has suffered rape and murder, I think I have a capacity that's maybe a little rare. I think I can talk to the Serbs and the Croats and the Muslims. I can talk to the UN people, I can talk to the business people, and I think I can get them together. And just maybe I can build peace. So in her kind of bombed out bakery peace hub, she begun the kind of work that the four of you have been describing so beautifully. And I wondered too about another short story. If I may just kind of flip forward to my other best friend in the world, the beaver. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't need any reminding uh, about how amazing this creature is, but let me tell you just something very quickly. The beaver and human beings are the only two species on Earth that scientists call keystone. Why? Because they build habitats. They build habitats not just for themselves, but for others. The beaver, in creating the dam, allows the fish to form, the herons to come, the foxes to get the herons, and, and so on. They build ecosystems. And I think that's what's happening here. We are building ecosystems and creating safe spaces to have the really difficult conversations uh, that this world needs. So, yeah, thanks for sharing, and maybe there's something in the conveners and the beavers that can inspire all of us. Thanks, Jonathan. And yes, we are, um, you know, creating those ecosystems and being, you know, considerate of the people that live in them and making sure that they have a, you know, a place on the, um, around the table to also be able to say what they need and helping them you know, get the support that they need uh, as well, I think is really important. And that's what we try to do uh, at ACTED and through the three zero houses and through the impactful organizations that you that you all uh, work in. Um, and I guess my next question is more related to also the role of technology, because we've just talked about the way we support, you know, local communities. We develop these localized approaches. But in a world where we love to talk now about uh, AI, about the role of technology. I was wondering if you could give us a bit more insights on what do you think uh, the role of technology plays in developing and constructing those ecosystems? 
and it can be low and or high tech. I know Denis said you love the term frugal innovation. <laughs> so I would be really interested to having a better understanding from each of your point of view and from, from coming from your different countries, how you think technology has a role to play in scaling local innovations. And maybe you can provide maybe one example of a successful story uh, through technology and how that was important. Uh, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe the hand is, yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like we should like put the context first of, for instance, in Sri Lanka, most of the youngsters, most of the people, they do have access to a mobile phone, to smartphone, etc. But when it comes to um, the communities we're working with, uh, it can be farmers, it can be fishermen, it can be um, the children from um, rural area, for instance, most of the time the network is not working properly. So at that stage, uh, what we uh, focus more is like to um, create, like to foster the dialogue, to foster the discussions, to be like in present, like most of the programs we're doing. After we obviously uh, know like technology is a powerful tool, it's an amplifier, uh, it can connect people, it can give you access to anything, especially learning, especially uh, uh, trainings, uh, funding opportunities, etc. So this is something we use for the entrepreneurs, for instance, because most of the entrepreneurs we uh, supporting is like in big cities, so Colombo, Vavonia, Baticola, etc. Um, so if I can give like some example, and obviously we would like also those young people um, to go back a bit, uh, to be more inclusive, uh, to be more um, a, dri a driving force for the rural communities, because they tend to, li to leave, unfortunately, those communities to uh, come uh, to uh, more urbanized um, uh, cities. But we also like fostering, we also like motivating them, uh, we also like not convincing them, but trying to um, showcase how much, how many opportunities you could have also in those uh, areas uh, where we're supporting people, where there are needs, where there are, um, you know, a sphere of innovation. So in that sense, um, if I can give an idea or an example of um, how technology can be very useful. So in Sri Lanka, we have, um, a brand we are very proud of. Uh, it's called Spacelan. I know it doesn't uh, sound like a very uh, regenerative, but it's a regenerative brand. Um, so basically, they do produce uh, some Ayurvedic product, completely rooted in Sri Lankan tradition. So it's mostly made of coconut uh, products. So it can be oil, uh, it can be the water, it can be the scraps. Um, uh, so it's uh, completely natural and, and it has a regenerative approach um, and uh, it went viral like five years ago and now they have like uh, uh, stores in more than 23 countries uh, around the world. So this is how like technology, social media can be powerful for like such a small company suddenly, okay, a lot of people are interested and they started to open like pop-up stores and now they have proper stores. So those are examples uh, how you can use technology, but this is one case, obviously. So the easiest way for me uh, to use technology is first to give access, uh, to give access to uh, facilities, to give access to uh, learning, to give access to information. Um, so this is what I see uh, for the moment to the people we uh, support in Sri Lanka. And opportunities, obviously. So um, it's great to hear the war SS. Um, so let me take you back to two time period. Um, so if we go back to to 2010, um, 14 years ago, in Yama, um, the uh, the mobile phones, the mobile SIM cards, are kind of like a lottery because. Uh, you get a mobile phone SIM card, you need to apply for a government, and then they have a monthly lottery system. If you won the lottery, you will have the chance to pay 1,000, uh, well, around 1,500 
um, USB to get the, the SIM card, not the mobile uh, uh, handset, just a SIM card. So it was uh, there's a lot of like corruptions there, like um, some people having full of draw, like SIM card full of uh, drawer full of SIM card, trading them with you know um, cars and apartments and. Then a few years later, one of the civilian government comes in that um, the it, it is uh, a lot more easier uh, now. Mobile phone become a you know a dollar uh, SIM card, so it's considered like a one thousand five hundred to a dollar. So everyone have a mobile phone and they have that access. Then you know uh, the development in terms of like you know. Um, Internet-based development has uh, accelerated uh, so much, but at one day another period is that on the first of um, February 2021, all our phones, uh, all our internet has stopped working. All our phones have stopped working. So that's the day of the coup d'état. The government has cut off all the um, uh, uh, communication channels, and it didn't came back until like. Um, until the, the mid noon, but the internet didn't come back. Um, later, they gave access to the internet, but for a few months until um, yeah, until a few months. Less, I don't think I don't remember exactly, but about at least four or five months from one a.m. in the after midnight until nine a.m. The internet was cut off like a clockwork. Then though you cannot like access anything at all, so the accelerated growth of uh, has become uh, a major issue. Then now we get twenty four hours internet, but it is highly censored. Um, like uh, popular social media services like Facebook or uh, X are banned, and uh, messengers. Uh, including WhatsApp is also banned. Uh, of course, we can use like VPN uh, to access those, but using VPN, uh, if you were found using VPN, you are you can be put into jail uh, and sentenced for about three years. So, but everyone use it. Why? The government could also put everyone if they want to put you into jail. So you are put in on a long leash, of course. What we were trying to say is that our program, when we pivoted these issues, we are facing no, uh, like from the design practice to uh, 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 humanitarian actors, we have no access to uh, reliable uh, digital tools. So what we do is, okay, let's plan for different scenarios, different modalities. The first is no tech at all. If we need to go and have to use pen and paper, then that's what we're gonna be using. And then if we still have a phone, then that's gonna be what we will be using with scenario. Then we decided like if you have we have like a messengers, like for example we don't have WhatsApp or what messenger, so we use like what whatever we have, like for example like there's a telegram, so we use telegram um, to mobilize resources. So in different scenario, uh, we try to mobilize, we provide training, we provide capacity building. And um, so in 2021, uh, we won a award, um, the Social Innovation um, Grand Challenge Award by the Asian Pre uh, Disaster Preparedness Center. For that, no tech to uh, kind of low tech uh, innovation. And through the grant, we are also building up median tech uh, where we have uh, a digital platform and uh, a dashboard for impact measuring and and monitoring. Um, so, but we ha still have all these previous um, modalities. So tomorrow there's no tech at all. Then we can roll back to no tech solution. So um, again, uh, I really like the the terms like Google innovation. It's not like uh, AI and 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 uh, 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 you know. Uh, um, the augmented reality things, and also how we use what we have uh, to in, to re really innovate. So yeah, that's a success story for, for my side. Yeah. Thanks, Turin.
And what about um, Sabu, Jonathan, Mai? How do you vision technology and its role? Do you agree with Turin that actually frugal innovation is sometimes way more effective than using like hardcore technology? Uh, in technology, especially when we talk about uh, high tech, you know, like uh, startups, obviously you are looking for the solutions which can scale up easily. And uh, to be honest, a lot of innovations have already happened in the world. It's a matter of replication, basically. So what we do in uh, what we do in um, our uh, let's say accelerator is that. We localize those innovative solutions that had been already uh, uh, in, I mean, discovered. Uh, uh, let's say so uh, by so it's really depending on the community needs. Um, I have to say that it's quite challenging also in Tajikistan because we are we are a very thin market. You know? So when you talk about Philippines, which is 100. Uh, 15 million, uh, uh, I mean, solutions can easily, you know, like scale up. But in Tajikistan, it's uh, not the case. And also the uh, economic situation is not as good. Uh, so what we try to do is to see where exactly what solution can help and can scale at least at local level. So one of the examples, I mean, there are a lot of examples, but one of the examples I could bring is that um, we were able You know, um, Tajikistan has a very, uh, in agriculture, we have really uh, varieties of vegetables and fruits, but due to a very poor supply chain, uh, almost 30% of the um, agriculture commodities or products get uh, uh, wasted. So what we came up with a solution was to create a marketplace uh, and to uh, come up also with a model of supply chain so that Uh, you know, like uh, the, that uh, loss will be either less or it will be eliminated. So, of course, it, although it seems very easy, but for us it wasn't easy. So it's like we started working uh, and supporting one of the startups, which uh, named Aval, Aval Saldo, and then uh, we came up for also. So when you work. Um, Uh, in big in the such solutions in such isolated or let's say uh, places that are all obviously coming some uh, not only the startup issues but also the ecosystem one right so you you need to make sure that they are compliant also with that so it's it created a sort of um, um, it created a lot of work not only on the level of the startup but also on the level of the ecosystem and policy development So, and at the time, the country was just passing the law of e-commerce. So, I think um, what is good about being functioning in a platform like Triple Zero House, it also gives you a tool for sort of accelerating the advocacy and policy reform so that you can enforce some of the changes faster, you know, uh, by also showcasing some results of the work that startups are doing and achieving, so showing the government, you see this is how it could work, you know, it's working, let's get it, you know, passed. So this is, I think, uh, one of the advantages of being uh, within the triple zero house and also being able to reach out in um, advocacy and policy level. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I actually I, I can share a, a one high tech and a low tech one. Uh, I'm building off uh, Sabo's point also about localizing uh, technologies. Um, I think technology is uh, critical as long as it's needs based. Um, because again, no, we are coming from different uh, social economic demographics. We are coming from different uh, backgrounds. And for a country like the Philippines, again, it's very uh, diverse. It's multicultural as well. Um, just to uh, uh, jump off again from my previous point earlier that while we have, for example, one of the most beautiful beaches, uh, many, we have a lot of, uh, uh, of, of rich natural resources. Um, in terms of, uh, for example, plastic waste, you know, uh, we are uh, by capita per person, uh, we are actually, we do not generate a lot per person, uh, but we are one of the top um, in terms of mismanaged plastics. 
Um, so that's a very critical um, challenge for the Philippines uh, as well. So this is where technology comes in. And I actually have props. I have materials to share with you. So this is an example of a high-tech uh, solution that uh, was adapted to the Philippines. This is a board that you can turn into uh, furniture materials, uh, construction materials later on. Um, that was adapted from the technology uh, based in Vietnam. Uh, it was a social enterprise uh, model um, that was brought into the Philippines uh, to essentially address uh, a plastics challenge. So for context in the Philippines, these are actually, this is 100% board made of uh, sachets, flexible plastics, which essentially in the Philippines, they have zero value. You cannot sell this to recyclers. Uh, recyclers will just collect it, but will not pay you. They will not even collect it to an extent. So technology comes in by bringing value to this otherwise no value. If it has no value, people will not collect it. It will end up where? In our rivers. So this is where technology, I think, uh, comes in very much and in entrepreneurship because, again, the challenge of scaling down the line. No? But in the Philippines as well, it's always ad about adapting it to your context. Uh, for example, we make this, uh, the social enterprise uh, Evergreen Labs uh, through this, uh, what they call reform plastic, um, actually tailors their solution depending on the needs of the communities as well. Because they want to make sure that whatever value we get from these boards, it actually translates to income from those waste pickers. We actually have a big economy also of informal waste pickers in the country. So our recycling economy is not as sophisticated, I guess, than here in Paris, no. Um, but for us, uh, for, for, for the Philippines, it's an opportunity to provide income, at the same time address an environmental challenge. Um, how the 3 Zero House actually worked with them was by linking them to a cooperative who actually works with persons with disabilities. Now, with, by fostering that linkage, we are actually able to link an environmental solution to a social uh, challenge. So, so now they're actually partnering so that the, co the cooperative collects the plastics and gets, uh, uh, gets value in exchange. That's a high-tech solution. But a low-tech solution can come in as simple as this bag. This is a hand-sewn bag. Uh, actually, it's machine uh, sewn. No? It's a, it, it uses a sewing machine. Um, but this is actually made uh, by a social entrepreneur uh, who is a person with disability. Um, the story behind this is actually this social entrepreneur went through one of the capacity building programs that we had at the 30 House through a local implementing partner, uh, CSO, Sustainable PH. Um, Jonathan was thinking about the name of this new profession. No? I think for us it's as simple as bringing in more sustainability professions, uh, professionals in the country where there's actually very limited education opportunities around climate, environment, uh, we don't, uh, I think it's more common here already, but in the Philippines, we need to upskill a lot of professionals and practitioners. So this social entrepreneur went through the training program, and after that, uh, she felt uh, that uh, she, she wanted to bring back her advocacy, which is actually uh, being a self-advocate. Um, and that meant bringing, going back to her sewing machine and actually looking at, uh, this, this is denim, so scrap denim, she turns it into bags. Uh, beautiful bags, accessories, um, and she turns value out of it. So, and now she's also training other persons with disabilities. So tech can be as high tech as this board or as low tech as uh, your, user, your typical sewing machine may be already stored in your old grandma's house or something. Um, but it, it, it solves uh, a certain um, uh, uh, social uh, and environmental problem. So I think no, as long as technology is adapted to the needs of, of the community, and if you listen very well to the community, it will have its use. So it's not even AI or, or blockchain or, or, or all of those sophisticated tech that I'm talking about. It's practical solutions that you can easily do uh, for I in your communities. So, yeah. So uh, I think we're all saying yes to your question. Um, Two, two, two very quick stories as well, if I may. So the, the first is um, in this extraordinary barren environment um, on the Syria-Jordan border, um, the UN has built what it considers to be a world-class refugee camp, which is very ordered and structured, but it's the most uh, desolate uh, and soul-destroying place. And I was there talking with a, a nine-year-old girl, and I asked her what her dreams for the future were, and she said to me, to touch a tree. So we made a plan, uh, the nine-year-old and a few of us. Our plan was to create a park in the middle of this uh, barren refugee camp. Um, it would be a beautiful play space. We would organize lots of materials to come in and a bit of water. But the answer from the authorities, the military police, was no. 
no water allowed, no materials can come in. And so our imaginations, well, in a moment where we're crushed, how on earth could we create places to play in the wild in this refugee camp? And then it dawned on us that in these 20,000 huts, they each had a backyard, a tiny space, that typically was the rubbish dump for the things the household didn't want inside their little, their little shack. And if we could turn 20,000 tiny backyards into vibrant play spaces, then this place might come alive. Maybe they didn't need a massive big park, maybe they just needed 20,000 tiny ones. But how to do that? Because there were no materials allowed in, there was no water allowed in. But everyone had WhatsApp. So we launched a competition. We gave everyone seven days. Can you transform your backyard into the most magical place for your kids? And on WhatsApp, they started to share ideas, videos, evidence that it was possible uh, through the kind of waste that you're talking, talking about to make beauty. And maybe there's just a quick little uh, image to show um, all grainy images that, that, that came in. Um, but in the slide that follows, there's, there's just some evidence of beginning to come alive. 20,000 tiny play spaces. Just through a simple WhatsApp message to launch a competition. Who could create the most vibrant place? And then one other, even quick, quicker short story. Uh, back to the Impact Hub days. Um, we had physical buildings, like, like your amazing Three Zero houses, you still do, there's 110 of them around the world in about 60 countries. And it was a model that went to scale very fast. Sometimes I wish we could have stopped it going so fast. But every month, uh, we'd raise a million bucks and we'd create another physical space and another hub would open. And people think that we must have done it through a kind of Starbucks strategy. We had to have a headquarters and a staff team. But no, we couldn't afford a headquarters. We couldn't afford staff. We just had lots of people wanting to open hubs around the world. So what did we do? We, we launched a wiki. I think it was 10 bucks. Um, and the wiki was where we put our knowledge. How do you create the furniture, the business model? How do you hire the beavers, hosts, convener types? Everything was on the wiki. And then we mapped the communication about how these 110 hubs happened and how $100 million um, dollars was raised. No, no headquarters, no center. All of it was hub to hub. And some of the star hubs got, most, you know, got a lot of the communication, but everybody was asked for their advice. You could begin to see all these relationships form. And a movement was created that powered a really serious business model. So technology in the form of a basic $10 wiki helped grow a multinational operation with no headquarters, and no, no center. Thank you for all of these amazing success stories. It's really interesting to hear you talk about these different um, entrepreneurial endeavors. And yeah, it's really interesting also to see that maybe sometimes low tech can have a greater impact than high tech. And I really loved what you were, were showing, my in terms of the difference between high and low tech. Uh, and I think often we think, oh, technology, high tech, AI, but sometimes it's you know frugal innovation that has the most impact. And it's the way we use tech also. I think it's really interesting to also remind people that not everyone has access to tech. Who has access to tech? Do we use tech for good or it's for something else? So thank you for all of these really amazing answers. I'm just checking for the time because I could talk all day long. <laughs> but do we have maybe time for one last question? 30, 30 seconds? Oh, okay, so it's cool. So we have, okay, I thought I was overboard. Okay, cool. So we can do the, maybe this last question. Um, I kind of wanted to, now that we understand a little bit the context of each of your countries, we understand the role uh, technology can play. Um, I wanted to also maybe get your feedback and insight on how entrepreneurs um, can effectively collaborate with larger organizations, governments, NGOs to amplify the, 
their innovations or just to amplify impact on global challenges. Sabo, you were talking a little bit about how we use international platforms like the 30 forums to talk about these issues, to showcase innovations. Um, do you see any other way? How do you, with your organizations, with the 30 houses, how do you work with governments, NGOs, to really amplify and try to reach as much people as possible? I'd be really interested to know. So, Danusia, do you want to start again? <laughs> I can see you're starting to, to sleep. So, at the Trizero House Sri Lanka, uh, we have co-designed uh, a, speci I mean, a specific incubation program. So basically, instead of internalizing all the trainings, uh, we have uh, involved um, key stakeholders especially based on the expertise. So we did like uh, ecosystem mapping and we kind of um, identified uh, key players uh, from uh, for each 30 house in Sri Lanka. So basically we have like a four months program, different key, sto uh, key uh, stakeholders, it can be government agencies, it can be uh, prestigious incubator accelerator in Sri Lanka. It can be um, a network on investors, so key partners like this, and they have a special, a specific session, a specific training in that incubation program. That way, because most of the entrepreneurs we are supporting, they're coming from vulnerable communities, uh, not necessarily from um, the capital or the big cities. We connecting them um, to those uh, players, we enabling them uh, to um, to create new opportunities that might come uh, from them. So this is one thing we do a lot. Uh, another thing we like to do is to do like small uh, networking event, basically, uh, especially uh, to dialogue. Um, I feel like the youth, um, and I feel like it's in most of the countries, but in Sri Lanka especially, um, they have a lot to say and not necessarily to the relatives. Most of the time it's like to um, governmental representative, it can be to NGOs, they sometimes question what we're doing, etc. So we kind of create also those uh, circle where they can share their thinking, uh, they can share their ideas, they can, uh, they can share their frustration, uh, so that it also helps us to improve ourselves. It's also improve um, um, the type of activities we could develop, the, uh, our programmatic, etc. So we also um, set those type of uh, dialogue uh, environment. Um, yeah, that's the two practical things we do in Sri Lanka at the Three Zero House. So, uh, <coughs> so the. Again, going back to Myanmar context, um, um, for entrepreneur, um, as Joanne and also as a Treasure House, um, in current context, uh, we don't engage with the government through military hunter. Um, so that also limits most of our uh, interaction. Um, but what we are currently facing is the um, uh, how the integration of the uh, private sector into uh, development, uh, urban development uh, sector as well. So because we, um, in, I mean, in, in, I think it's not only exclusive to Myanmar, but in many parts of the world as well, that the um, the UN agency and development agency have the fear of like working with private sectors. Um, the um, even the tendering process has a very long and process, um, and uh, sometimes it takes years long to to get things moving, and then also for um, um, you know to receive funding is quite difficult. But in Myanmar, uh, the the civil space for NGO has shrunken uh, quite a bit. That means that. Um, it's been a uh, uh, changing uh, this through this localization, working with private sectors, entrepreneur uh, has become a, a, a way to go. But it's been accelerating, but it's not as uh, fast as we hope to see. Um, that's one thing. Um, but also as entrepreneur, there's a, a, a lot of like uh, um, uh, opportunities. 
uh, bring in uh, innovations. So um, most of the development agencies are uh, um, stuck in their cycles of uh, doing the program design, but doesn't really bring in innovation. So the innovations come from most of the innovation comes from the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so that is also um, we are trying to to uh, lead. Uh, we, we are also a leading voice uh, in the localization approach as well. So what we try to achieve is that um, uh, instead of like spending uh, so much money in overheads and and uh, um, just as uh, as I mentioned, as like a headquarters and and um, <laughs> but what is really most effective, as we uh, mentioned earlier, that the grassroots organization easy to mobilize, easy to um, um, uh, share results, and then also to to really um, uh, make uh, uh, lasting change. So they need to, you know, take take that dive of uh, uh, deep, uh, that deep of like you know, uh, so that this change could be happening. Um, so far, uh, it's been happening, but it's not as uh, much as we could we want to see. And then um, the other approach that we are trying to see is that instead of like a parachuted uh, solution, we um, have our own solution, which are somewhat flexible um, to different thematic area, different donors need, but we won't change who we are. This is our program, and we want to work with such donors and such donors. Um, but we won't change who we are because that create that would provide assurance of sustainability. If we are changing and to the tunes of different donors and changing the the, the program for each specific requirement, then uh, it's, it's, it's that it's not very sustainable. Uh, after the program ends of like four year cycles, everything has to start. From scratch again. So instead of doing that, this is the localized solution proposed by the localized actor. Spend it. We will be as, um, you know, uh, uh, adaptable and flexible as possible. But we won't be able to, um, you know, uh, match to the, uh, the 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 donors. So. But donor also donor organizations and and funding organizations also need to change their mindset, so that uh, the localization could also be, uh, yeah, uh, a progress as well. So thank you. Well, this morning, when I was listening to the speech of Mayor of Paris. Uh, it sounded like the music to my ear <laughs> because um, I think um, everything has to be inclusive. It's not just the effort of the government or private sector or NGO or CSOs. It is an inclusive process. We all have one goal, you know, to reach uh, to achieve a prosperous society that will be economically also independent, right? Um, for that, um, I think People Zero House is a very, um, at least I will speak about Tajikistan, is a very unique platform where you can also showcase, you can accelerate some changes, you can um, tailor uh, some initiatives based on the needs of community, right? And also, you can upscale it. Upscale, in our case, is that I know that there are some talkings with the Kyrgyzstan and other countries surrounded by Tajikistan. So it's like if it works, the model here, it can be worked elsewhere too. So um, I think you cannot bypass either, let's say, uh, government or either private sector. Definitely, the sustainability should be there. Topic. I I want to use this opportunity to uh, express my heartfelt thank to the taxpayers of you know such countries like France that help really the countries like us. But I think we also need to think about 
that they can't pay us endlessly, you know. So we need to think about the sustainability in a way that so we can also contribute to the welfare of the uh, of our countries as well as uh, globally. Globally. Yeah. Maybe the same order. <laughs> so. Um, I do hope that uh, if there are definitely entrepreneurs in this room, um, we are thinking about uh, scaling our impact and not just our bottom line, like financial bottom line. So I do hope because you, that's why you're here. No, you want to uh, you want to effectively uh, essentially reach uh, expand your market because you want to expand your social and environmental impact. Um, uh, for 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 me, I think the the, the three zero houses um, are actually a good way to to engage uh, more meaningfully with different stakeholders because that's what uh, they are created for. Uh, you come to a 30 house, you need linkages, um, you can reach out to your local coordinator if their house is already there. Um, but I think how you want to uh, strategically uh, um, connect uh, and engage with these stakeholders, let's say you're an entrepreneur. Um, the example of uh, Evergreen Labs that I shared earlier is uh, linking uh, with a community uh, with, with a civil society organization whose advocacy is already around uh, uh, supporting persons with disabilities. And as an entrepreneur, you're able to actually tap uh, a, a market uh, in there. So but another way to actually uh, 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 tackle this is um, by closely listening to what is already being done uh, by the other stakeholders. Uh, because as entrepreneurs, you have the opportunity to make the model sustainable as well. So this is another example that I have now. This is actually an output of a university. It's called Baligtarin Mo in English, Turn It Around. These are actually artworks, uh, crowdsourced artworks from youth. No? So they want to essentially um, explore uh, by experience uh, and art, artistic expression, what the youth hopes uh, for the future. So. This could actually give you a glimpse uh, of how uh, the youth are actually thinking, for example, about uh, climate or the climate crisis in the country. It's actually adapted already. It's a, it's a, I think it's a global learning tool. Already it was adapted to the Philippine University as well. So as entrepreneurs, you want to look at uh, the available um, um, insights that are already out there in universities, civil society organizations, um, and really empathizing with their experience and uh, understanding as entrepreneurs how can you uh, use, let's say, maybe market-based uh, instruments? How can you use innovation to possibly, for example, reach more communities? Uh, because uh, the other stakeholders may not have this mindset. For them, it's all about direct impact already in their existing only community. But maybe it could be a replicable solution um, in, in other uh, places of this world. Um, and I think that's where uh, also um, being able to find strategic connections uh, will help you. So, for example, one way, again, is through your 3 zero house coordinators. Um, here, of course, you have uh, Luis uh, in Paris. Uh, but if you're, say, in the Philippines, uh, in, in Tajikistan, Myanmar, uh, Sri Lanka, um, uh, it, it's a good way for you to, uh, to be exposed uh, to this. Uh, because what uh, I firmly believe no, is professionals like us uh, have to be systemic thinkers. Uh, we are already in the world where we have to be interdisciplinary and we have to look at uh, from another's point of view. Um, so that's way, that's another way. In the Philippines, we also have uh, what we call uh, uh, ecosystem enablers. Uh, I think that's pretty much our uh, Sabo's work also as an accelerator. Uh, we have those actors like Vilgro uh, Philippines who do that. Um, if you are a youth, you can actually join communities. So I believe there's the Global Shapers Community uh, Paris Hub. Uh, they have one of the booths here. So because that's your way to actually access uh, like-minded uh, individuals who have their uh, specific expertise. Uh, and that way you can bridge uh, what you are good at uh, and add value to the other uh, stakeholders. Uh, and effectively, you are able to uh, reach uh, a new market, uh, a new possible uh, impact area. So, um, but I, I think at, uh, at the end of it all, no, uh, I, I, my call to action is actually to listen more deeply because I think uh, many times the solutions are actually already there. Uh, maybe it's a matter of you becoming that bridge uh, for that solution to another area, uh, or actually expanding the horizons of that solution. So, yeah, I think that's that's how I'd put it.
I really like this bridge um, thought and the sort of, in a way, the missing link between I think the, the heart of your question, the kind of the big guys and, uh, and the rest of us. Um, but as, as, as you and others were saying, the big guys have got a lot of stuff wrong. So, so it's not just about making friends, it's not just about um, important bridges, it's, it's also about somehow the skill that you're also describing, about some systemic thinking and some, some speaking truth to power. And I'm reminded you know, of our, our work at Civic across the Sahel, where there's an audacious vision uh, it's called the Great Green Wall. And it's, it's, it's not like Trump's wall, it's, it's this incredible tapestry of, 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 of green. Um, stopping in the desert encroaching any further. But our, you know, our, our dear friend there, Kimo, who, who funds so much of this movement, says to us, look, you know, not so long ago, um, in the slave trade, they were forcing us into boats. Now, we willingly jump into them uh, and try our luck getting into Europe. It's that bad, and you know, the temperatures across the Sahel are rising faster than anywhere else on Earth. And yet the institutions, the people that we're talking about wanting to sort of somehow bridge to you and, and, and um, tap into their, their expertise, tap into their capital, they've got it wrong. You know, they've, they've been spending hundreds of million bucks uh, on top-down, um, redundant stuff. And so in the efforts to, to, to bridge, to, to be the missing links, I think we have to find the skill of both being the holders of kind of relationships, but also truth. Uh, I'm reminded, uh, not, not just of, of the beaver, but, but of another rather incredible uh, animal, um, the butterfly. And as the butterfly um, comes into being, and the, kind of the caterpillar and the, the, the creates the... the this, I mean, I'm no biologist, so I'm explaining this very, very badly, but, but, but uh, I know one term from biology around how the, the, the caterpillar becomes the butterfly, and that's called the imaginal cell. So the, the caterpillar grows the imaginal cell, which is the blueprint for this beautiful butterfly. But the trick about the imaginal cell is it's not just beautiful. It doesn't just have the DNA of the future. It also has a very destructive power. It eats the caterpillar. And so we kind of need to have, I, know, the, I think we all demonstrated very beautifully, the, the courage to be the imaginal cells, to have dreams of a better world, but also the kind of blunt grit truth of your systems aren't working and they need to change. So let's be butterflies too. Thanks, Jonathan. Really like that image of the butterfly. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to answer those questions and for giving us, you know, just a better overview of what's happening in your countries. What are you doing with your organization? It's just really inspiring. And thank you again for coming from so far to take this time to talk to everyone here. Um, I, we have five minutes left. So I don't know if there are any questions in the room or anyone who would like to ask a question. Yes, I can see someone, but I don't know if we have mics. Maybe would you be willing to, to come down and ask your question? Because we have mics that are not, ah, oh, wow. That, that was quick. You have a mic coming. Merci. Um. Is it? Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering, because we know that in some countries it's more challenging than others when it comes for women to develop their own business, particularly when it comes to technology. So, of course, now I'm more thinking about high tech, even though what you said about low tech was really interesting. So, I was wondering if through your different organizations, you have implemented specific strategies to address women and help them or if it's just one plan that happens to be particularly uh, applicable to women as well. Thank you very much. Um, in Sri Lanka, uh, the society is very matriarchal. So we have a lot of women actually who are working 
especially in the, in the farming sector, in the education system. Um, so we do support them as actors, the Tree Zero House, to go further and uh, especially to become specific entrepreneur or even like to include tech uh, in what they would like to scale. Um, but the main issue we're having with the women uh, in Sri Lanka is about um, abuse, discrimination, um, violence, etc. Um, but economically speaking, um, a lot of them are independent in Sri Lanka. So we mostly like um, trying to further that. And as ACTED, the NGO, we do have programs in the past um, uh, to reduce the inequalities, um, to be working on gender balances and uh, things like this. Yes. I can also add, maybe you can, can you flash the slide with the other orgs? Uh, so uh, to echo what Danusha has said, uh, with, with the Peace for, for, for ACTED's programming, uh, it, was, it was already integrated in terms of adopting a gender lens. So we do have, for example, uh, as, yeah, this is for that, there. Uh, we do have, um, um, uh, when we uh, do our uh, program uh, planning uh, at the earlier uh, in the project proposals even, um, there's always, for example, in the selection of uh, target partners and at the same time, uh, tailored uh, interventions uh, specific to women. To an extent, we would have programs that are specifically for women, uh, supporting women-led uh, enterprises. Uh, and one example from the 3-0 House Network is actually Vilgro Philippines. Uh, they're actually an all-women-led uh, accelerator uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, mostly uh, the staff are also even women. So when they do their programming, uh, it's actually uh, very much considers already uh, the, the needs of female entrepreneurs, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, in the country. Um, just for context, additional context, in the Philippines, by population, uh, it's a 50-50. There is 50% uh, percent, even 50% percent, uh, men, but the roles uh, are pretty much uh, still uh, in, uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, females always have the traditional roles of being in the household. Uh, but that has already been changing, uh, because also women, uh, with the workforce, women have uh, found their own startups, so uh, ecosystem players, uh, like Villagro Philippines, uh, have that specific focus. Um, but in terms of uh, active choose your house programming, uh, we do have integrated uh, that uh, already in, in how we operate as well. So maybe just a bit more context. If you do have, uh, if you uh, would like to learn more about the organizations uh, in the Philippines, maybe you can take a snapshot of, of this one. Um, and you'll find a, a, a more detailed, uh, you can flash it again so people can uh, take a photo. Uh, you'll find uh, more uh, descriptions uh, about these organizations, and perhaps you can look at which ones are might be relevant uh, to you, to women uh, as well. Well, about gender inclusivity, uh, the Triple Zero House Tajikistan has one uh, of the partners. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that on the core of each program or each activity. We're planning to um, uh, to do is uh, the gender inclusivity comes first because, as I earlier mentioned, uh, Tajikistan's population, especially the less ad uh, disadvantaged, uh, less advantaged uh, group of population, are consisting of women and youth. So, of course, we are targeting them, and we make sure that uh, we put them in the core of the proposal. And secondly, um, in Triple Zero House Tajikistan, there is a partner that we call them Chatter. It's basically a shelter for the uh, women who were affected by uh, domestic violence and the other form of abuse and what they have done, uh, that um, they have created this um, um, women empowerment uh, sort of center where they um, teach them, they make them economically uh, more sustainable, so they, they find jobs. So yeah, definitely, we do put that at the core of all our, uh, and, and especially myself being a woman, and uh, being a mom of three amazing children, I understand what are the obstacles women are facing on a daily to day basis. And uh, especially in Tajikistan, the access to education and other uh, opportunities are quite limited. We do put the women above when we do 
uh, designing of the programs. So um, again, uh, we in Myanmar are currently actually for quite repeatedly that we're going through a humanitarian crisis. But again, these kind of issues cannot be worked uh, until things get sorted out. So in all our program, uh, we emphasize on gender uh, uh, inclusivity uh, and gender and social inclusivity, um, and also at three for a startup and then also business plan training and, 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 and so on. Um, at Doin, we also have a gender mainstreaming program called the uh, Women in Construction, uh, where we provide training and capacity for women to progress. Uh, in, in Myanmar, like in construction centers, that the women's roles are clearly defined, which is whether they are at very low level or at very high level uh, as, as a, you know, engineer or architect, but at a very low level, the, it's just an entry job where they have to carry heavy things, or, or, but or they don't really progress to, uh, to become a skilled laborer. So to, to break that uh, the norm and to have more gender transformative approach, that we just kick off our women in construction uh, program, and highly we by the uh, this was contract uh, for the yeah, uh, we do take um, women issues and, and, and uh, quite um, seriously, and yeah, it's quite important for us as well. Very, very briefly, uh, and you said in your question that it isn't just happening, um, and of course in society it isn't. Um, you know, the, the women that, 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 that so many find themselves excluded or um, without the enabling conditions. But I think what we've been finding without pretending that we've got it all right, um, is if you get the conditions right at the beginning, then it does just happen. Um, if, if you create the enabling, inviting spaces, if, you, if, if the storytelling, the, the face, of, yeah, the diversity of, 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 of what you start with, the seed, is just about um, in keeping with vision for the world, then, then actually it does flow, and then the extent to which you then have to kind of assert a women-owned program or something, um, falls away because it's, it's happened. Um, and, and Thank you all. I think we have to end this lesson here, unfortunately. Thank you for coming and joining us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to ask more questions, Feel free to come and see us. We have a 30 house booth uh, not too far from here, or you can just uh, feel free to ask your questions in a couple of minutes. Thank you.